Okay, hello, it's good to be here. We're at St. Agnes. Today is a class for 20 minutes that we will look at the Trinity. The Trinity is going to be celebrated on May 30th. It's Trinity Sunday. I was ordained a priest on Trinity Sunday. It was a particular time in Rome to ordain priests. So it's an important mystery of our faith. Here we give you a little bit of an idea of the Holy Trinity, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll look at this a little carefully later on. But let me just bring to mind something that the Catechism tells us about the Trinity. It says that the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God in himself. It is therefore the source of all the other mysteries of faith, the light that enlightens them. It is the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of the truths of the faith. The whole history of salvation is identical with the history of the way and the means by which the one true God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reveals himself to men and reconciles and unites with himself those who turn away from sin. Central mystery. All of the other mysteries in one way or the other are related back to this one thing we know that we only know because God reveals it to us. However bright we may be, we could never have discovered that God is one God with three persons. We only know it because Jesus comes and reveals to us through revelation about the Father and the Holy Spirit as well as himself being the Son. Powerful, powerful mystery that sometimes we take for granted. Other people don't. They find that having three persons means we have three gods. Or that there is only one God but these three persons are not really important. It is, all of it is. But let's just look at a few things here today in this brief class. We could spend a lot more time on the Trinity. But we say that it's three persons in one God. We say it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's one God. They are equal. There is no difference between them. They are all, each one, totally God. It's not that they participate in Godhead, it's that each one is God. Now, how do we come to discover the relationship between them? Because they're all God, they're all equal. They all have the same power. They all are one God. The way we can begin to discover them is the relationship they have with each other. The relationship is that the Father is the creator of all things. And the Father has a son. He begets a son. His only begotten son, which is Jesus Christ. But he is the son of the Father. The Father loves the son as a father. The son loves the father as a son. And the relationship between these two is the only way we can begin to understand the, the, the distinctions between them. And then we realize that the father and the son have this incredibly powerful divine love. And from that love proceeds the Holy Spirit. The, relationship is so powerful between these two persons that it brings forth a new person. The Holy Spirit proceeds. The Father begets the Son. The Son is begotten from the Father. And from that relationship proceeds the Holy Spirit. Interesting because we know that we are made in the image and likeness of God. How many times have we heard that? It comes up. We see it in the beginning of Genesis. We're made in the image of God. Image, well, what is the image of God? Well, the image is that man is created all by himself, but he can't be alone. God is, is not 
solitary. God is not alone. Within God, there's three. So they all accompany each other. But man can't be alone. So what does God do? He creates a woman who comes from him. Now they're equal. They uh, have the same power. They have the same approach. There's no difference between them in terms of the way God looks at them or the way they look at each other. Obviously, we have struggles in the history of the world to understand that. But that's the way they are. And between the father and, or between, let's say, the husband and the wife, between the father and the mother, that love between them makes them become one flesh. And because of that oneness that comes through their loving relationship, which includes a powerful sexual relationship, from that oneness, a child proceeds from that love, and that's the child. That's a, a son or a daughter. So it's similar to the Trinity, the way the human family is created. It's part of being in the image and likeness of God, the family, in a certain way. We can't avoid that. I mean, part of it, it helps us to understand the relationship between a husband loves a woman as a husband does, and a woman loves her husband as a woman does. Different, equal, but that's how we distinguish them in a certain way. And from that love with each other, a child is born who loves both as a child towards his parents, but he's equal to the parents. He's also equal to them because he's created as well in the image of God. So all three of them are one. So we see the distinction within the family about how they relate to one another. Anyway, something to, to realize. But what we begin with is what are we talking about one God and three persons? Well, I would say we're talking about God. We're talking about divine nature. As human beings, we have a human nature. And I think you can see that none of us has ever come across anything that exists that different from its nature. You know what it is by the nature that it has. And in God, it's the divine nature of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, the Son assumes a human nature. When the Son assumes a human nature, it does not affect his divine nature. It doesn't mix in with the divine nature. The divine nature doesn't affect the human nature. The human nature doesn't affect the divine nature. And that happens in the person of the Son. Now, where do we get this notion of nature and person? Well, those were phrases developed philosophically probably in the first centuries of Christianity. Probably when you get to uh, the Council of Chalcedon in 481, whatever it was, you begin to see the notion of what is nature and what is person. So how can we talk about divine and human nature and person, a divine person and a human person, or an angelic person, among other things? Once we begin to understand this, and this is part of the reason why the creed began to be misunderstood, the Orthodox people say that the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, comes from the Father, and it's through the Son. Whereas as Catholics in the Western Church, we say that the Father and the Son brings the Holy Spirit together. So we say that. It's consubstantial, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Small detail, but at the time it was a big detail in theology. And probably there were some other elements involved. But what we begin to realize then is that Jesus Christ, the Son as a person, the Holy Spirit as a person, the Father as a person, form together one God. So in this triangle, we say the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. 
nor is the Holy Spirit the Father. And Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. Interesting what they are and what they aren't. Sometimes it's hard to grasp because it's such a very deep truth that our mind will never grasp it, ever, on this earth. We can only come remotely close to what God is all about. But this is what we're trying to do in this particular class in 20 minutes. So, we see this, this notion that the Son has a divine nature. So when I look at Jesus Christ, I'm looking at a divine being. I can't say that Jesus Christ is a human being, because he's not a human being. He's the divine being, but a divine being with a human nature, as well as a divine nature. So it has two natures in one person. Nobody does that. They call it the hypostatic union. A little bit of a fancy word, but that union of the two natures in one, in one person, the Son, who happens to be also divine, who is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Very hard to grasp, but it's something to reflect upon, because what we're trying to do is understand what God is and what God is not. And that's part of the Holy Trinity, that he is one God. I think it's beautiful that God is not alone. He has to have the others because that's the way God is. Uh, I can't say that's the way God is made because you don't say that. That's the way God is. And as God is, is the way he makes us in his image. And that's the way we are. And I think that helps us when we get down the road to some of the areas of understanding sexuality, gender, all of that. We come back to these basic truths and we realize who we are and what we are and who we are not, which right now people don't fully understand and so we get confusion. So the Father is not the Son or the Holy Spirit. He loves as a Father and the Son loves as a son. So from this, it's like a family, but then in the image and likeness of God, the husband does love the wife as woman, as a woman, not lesser or more, not uh, unequal in any way. He can't look down on a woman, nor can a woman look down on a man. I mean, yes, we read certain things in scripture that people confuse of St. Paul in times when he talks about the woman has to be subject to the man. But of course, it doesn't also mention that the man has to be subject to God. And so the man has to love the woman the way he loves himself. So you begin to realize if you go back to those points in scripture, which we won't go into here, you begin to realize that in those words that St. Paul uses, this is already in the background. And then it helps us to understand that the two, in loving each other, are equal. Now, you could say that within the nature of the household, the father has, you could say, the final decision after he's heard his wife, above all, as well as the other people in the family. But he still has that responsibility. But at the same time, he can't exercise that responsibility without talking to his wife. One of the great things about marriage is communication. If there is no communication, the marriage does not last. Because the father can't do what he wants to do just because he wants to do it. He has to communicate with his wife. He has to communicate with his kids. The wife has to communicate with the husband because there are many decisions she makes that she can't just make up on her own. She communicates. She communicates with her children. So that communication is part of this aura that takes place within the mystery of the Trinity. Now, you know, communication for them isn't something that goes through a period of time because there is no time. And because it's God, it's, I, I don't even want to say instantaneous because it's not even instantaneous, it just is. That's what God is. We have to imitate that as best as we can to follow God. So um, we go to Nazareth, and in a mysterious way, you could say that Nazareth is a trinity on earth that can lead us to the trinity in heaven. This is words 
of Saint Jose Maria Escrivá and others as well, but it was one of his favorite things was that we go to the Trinity on earth to enter into the Trinity of heaven. Trinity on earth is Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. <clears throat> so if we go into that household and we become part of that family, we already are entering into Mary, who is the mother of God. This is a big problem in early years, in the very early centuries, that Mary is the mother of Jesus, but not the mother of God. Well, how can you do that? Jesus is a person, a person who's divine and human, and Mary is the mother of that person who's divine and human. So she is the mother of God, not the mother of somehow another creature called Jesus Christ who's not yet God. It doesn't work. And then Joseph is called to be the father of God. How? Fundamentally, through his relationship to Mary. Because the two are in love, are married, and they become one as husband and wife. Not biologically, you don't have to have that sexual element, but you do have to have that communication and that oneness. And then Joseph is called in to be the father of Jesus Christ on earth. Mary and Joseph have this role, and Jesus, though he's the greatest, he's the son. He's the one who serves the parents, and who eventually, as he grows older, goes on to his own professional work, which is eventually to abandon his work as a carpenter, a very good carpenter, probably one of the best carpenters, to become a preacher, to become a rabbi, to tell people about what does the father want the people to understand who sent the son to tell them what he wants in this relationship of love. And the son relies on the Holy Spirit. Not only during his lifetime does he count on the strength of the Holy Spirit, but when he dies, as we have recently seen after the resurrection, he tells them that when he leaves, he's going to send them the Holy Spirit, who will take his place as another counselor, as a paraclete as someone who takes the place of the Son and guides the church down until the end of the ages. So he founds the church and starts it, and he leaves it to the Holy Spirit to continue to guide the church down. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have this arrangement. And when we go into the Holy Family, we're entering into this because Mary is the best daughter of the Father of all human creatures and is the mother of the Son, and Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not Joseph, it's the Holy Spirit. When Gabriel goes to her, she's not sure how this will take place, and he says, well, the Holy Spirit will come over you. And that's how she has the Son. So Mary is not even close to the level of God, ever. But of all creatures, she is immeasurably put into the center of the Trinity. And through her and through Joseph, we enter into the Trinity, particularly because her son is God. In her son being God, we eventually become sons and daughters of God through that. Because <clears throat> as human beings, we become brothers and sisters of the son because, because the human race is created as a family through the father and the mother, Adam and Eve, down through the ages. And when we enter into this human nature of the son, we are then brought into the divine nature. That's why children of God, people in, open, in, in the Catholic Church, are children of God because they become brothers and sisters of the son who is human but never abandon his divine nature. So as he enters his human nature, he's drawing us into his divine, as well as do we share his human nature. The best way a man or a woman can function is look at the example of Jesus Christ. And I don't mean the miracles and the teachings. <clears throat> look at the example of Jesus Christ as a son within this beautiful family that he belongs to, with Joseph and Mary as his parents. So, some ideas. Um, Sometimes people will say that we blaspheme because if you're Muslim, there's only one God, period. You say, well, yeah, but we have three persons. Well, that means you have three gods. No, that's not what we said, but that's what they think. 
We say God is our father. They say you can't do that. God is master and you're a slave. But you can never say that God is your father. That's blasphemous. Even in the Old Testament, it took time before the Jewish people understood that God is our father. It took time before people recognized that. And then, sure enough, when the sun reveals it, it fits. Things begin to come together. And then we see the Holy Spirit certainly in the Annunciation, but we see it at the baptism of our Lord where the Holy Spirit comes upon him visibly to John the Baptist. Then we begin to see, wow, there are these three persons, it took a while to say persons, but three persons who are all one God, the most holy, blessed Trinity. So uh, I think that can probably open a lot of questions to you as time goes on. Again, I always say if you have questions, Feel free to email in and ask whatever you want. We'll try and talk about it in the future. But we keep coming back to this great, wonderful world of the divine entering into the human nature and the human nature being drawn into the divine. And it's all being done because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as God decided to do this. Why? I don't, I don't know why. I can't figure it out. They decided out of love. They decided to create human nature and to create creatures with human nature. And then they decided out of some way to fall in love with us. And out of that love, they eventually draw us into their life, into their household, to become members of the household of God. So celebrate the Most Holy Trinity on May 30th. Please uh, remember to pray for St. Agnes on that great solemnity. And uh, thank you very much for listening in.